Well, I, I it's very rare that we see agreement between two prominent New York Times op-ed writers, one being Paul Krugman, the other being David Brooks. And uh, worthy of note, and particularly as we head into this uh, big immigra- uh, immigration uh, battle, uh, because this is another one of those issues that will uh, will rip apart the Republican Party in many respects. And we're already seeing uh, guys like Marco Rubio out there trying to trying in some way to put down a marker for his 2016 run. Uh, in the meantime, we may actually get some type of some type of immigration reform um, that um, is beginning to look somewhat encouraging. I mentioned uh, yesterday the proposal from the Gang of Eight, which I guess turned out to be seven, uh, because was it who was it uh, that uh, dropped off? Some uh, rep- a Republican senator who felt there was too much amnesty-ish about this uh, proposal. Uh, but we will talk about that as we continue. So uh, Paul Krugman yesterday, excuse me, on, uh, on Sunday, writes, Makers, Takers, and Fakers. And he writes, The prominent Republicans have begun acknowledging that their party needs to improve its image. But here's the thing, their proposals for a makeover all involve changing the sales pitch rather than the product. When it comes to substance, the GOP is more committed uh, than ever to policies that take from most Americans and give to a wealthy handful. The Republican Party has a two-pronged strategy right now to regain some type of national foothold. One is to pretend that they're not crazy. The other is to jerry-rig elections in what have been lean blue states on a national level by coming up with these uh, new type of electoral schemes. We've talked about these electoral schemes. But getting back to the uh, makeover, the extreme makeover they're trying to do, uh, David Brooks echoes Paul Krugman. On the surface, Republicans are already doing a good job of beginning to change their party. But so far, there have been more calls for change than actual evidence of change. In this reinvention process, Republicans seem to have spent no time talking to people who didn't already vote for them. They both cite Jindal and Paul Ryan and uh, Rubio. But as Paul Krugman reminds us, back in Louisiana, Jindal is pushing a plan to eliminate the state's income tax. You know, we've gotten a couple of emails and I've got received a couple of tweets from uh, listeners saying there is a move by Republicans in states like Kansas, like in uh, Louisiana, uh, probably a little bit less than a half dozen others to get rid of the income tax and replace it. With a state, um, excuse me, to get rid of the state's income tax and replace it with sales taxes. However, as Krugman points out, income tax falls most heavily on the affluent. And sales taxes fall much more heavily on the poor and middle class. The result would be big gains for the top 1%, substantial losses for the bottom 60%. Krugman goes on to talk about this in a more economic terms. Of course, Brooks, he's not so concerned about that. Bobo is happy in his suburbs. But Brooks's piece is completely incomprehensible. He goes on to say, if opposing government is your primary objective, it's hard to have a positive governing program. Well, this I agree with. I've been saying it for six to eight years, I think, on the radio that the Republicans cannot lead government because they they are fundamentally opposed to its existence. They don't see it as a mechanism to enhance people's lives. 
Brooks goes on to say, after a bunch of gibberish, the next problem with this mentality is that it makes it hard for Republicans to analyze social and economic problems that don't flow directly from big government. Brooks uh, apparently feels that he has the capacity to do this, although um, when you just talk about anecdotes that center around who drinks Chablis, um, one might find it hard. <laughs> Moreover, given all the anti-government rhetoric, people will never trust these Republicans to reform cherished programs like Social Security and Medicare. You can't be for entitlement reform and today's GOP because politically the two will never go together. Well, uh, and he goes... Can current Republicans change their underlying mentality to adopt these realities? Intellectual history says no. It's probably futile to try and change the current Republicans. So what is uh, David Brooks's fascinating prescription for this problem? It's smarter to build a new wing of the Republican Party. The second GOP wouldn't be based on the encroachment story that being that government is encroaching on your individual liberty, it would be based on the idea that America is being hit simultaneously by two crises, which you might call the Mancor olson crisis and the Charles Murray crisis. Olson argued that nations decline because their aging institutions get bloated in sclerotic and retard national dyna dynamism. Murray argues that America is coming apart, dividing into two nations, one with high education levels, stable families, and good opportunities. The other with low education levels, unstable families, and bad opportunities. Well, aside from uh, stipulating that Charles Murray is <laughs> sort of a horrible individual in many respects. Um, it sounds like what uh, Brooks is uh, signing off on is John Edwards' Two Americas. The second GOP would tackle both problems at once. It would be filled with people who recoiled at President Obama's second inaugural address because of its excessive faith in centralized power, but who don't share the absolute anti-government story of the current GOP. Well, what it sounds like is he wants to go back to the first, um, the first inaugural address of President Obama and the way that President Obama has basically been uh, leading, but uh, let's leave that aside for a moment. The question, the central question David Brooks leaves us with at the end of his piece is, who's going to build a second GOP? And fortunately for David Brooks, I have the answer. No one. No one. The entire project of the Republican base for the past 10 years is to rid itself of that second GOP that David Brooks so desperately pines for. In fact, to the extent that you need a second GOP, you're looking at probably a third to a half of the Democratic Party that embraces his neoliberal policies and basically, let's say, let's have a kinder, gentler way of screwing over the middle class and the poor in this country. But if David Brooks actually comes out and admits this, do you know what happens to David Brooks? He loses his job. He's got no reason to exist. He doesn't get invited back on to... Uh, on to the Lear Report, or whatever, whatever that PBS show is. Is it the Lear Report? He no it's longer the can... the News Hour. With the Jim News Lear. Hour. So David Brooks pretends like there is some possibility. Talk about intellectual history. David Brooks pretends there's some possibility for a second GOP. It is what it is, Mr. Brooks. I don't know how... What's left for him to write? He could just spend the rest of the decade writing mea culpas for all the things that he wrote in the first part of the Bush administration. <laughs> it's possible. You know what he said on the day of the invasion of Iraq or within the first week? He was on a radio show, and 
that he was talking with a guy who opposed the invasion, and he said, how does it feel to have your entire worldview crumble? He said that to somebody else? He said that to somebody who opposed the invasion. There you go. Well, now he knows. Although I suspect that happened quite a while ago. He still needs to cash checks, though.